Hi, um, my name is Stephen Heminger. I uh, work now for Microsoft, but this isn't a Microsoft talk, so I didn't do all the Microsoft logos. And I want to talk today about East-West virtual networking performance. Um, the one Microsoft bit here was, this was one of the areas that I initially focused on trying to improve in Hyper-V and Linux. And so one of the things I did was investigate how we're doing today on other systems. So I'll get back to that. Um, what I'm going to go over is where this, uh, where this shows up, what kind of tests I can do on it, what I found, and some crazy, stupid ideas that maybe will make this faster. Um, if you have looked at any of the standard tool sets that are out there now, we've got OpenStack, OPNFE, Docker, all of them create crazy network charts to have different components linking together with bridges and open vSwitch and FIDO routers and hardware and everything like that. So this is not some crazy thing. This really happens. Um, and if you're just trying to go from one VM to another, we call that east-west um, in the networking world. North-south is what Alex and everybody else is talking about earlier about getting out the door over the wire. This is just inside one VM environment. You're going between each other. And uh, you see OpenStack does it with bridges and tap devices. And uh, OPNFE does it. They actually chain things. And there's actually a benchmark, which I wanted to run, but it's not far enough along yet, that OPNFE guys have called VSPerf, that is basically take packets in from one network device, run it through one network function, go through a bridge to another network function, and then back out. Uh, the reason I couldn't run it is there's no, the test environment is all based on hardware-based traffic generators, and they don't have the software solution for that yet. But um, Docker has the same thing. They basically run through a virtual bridge. So, all these guys, this is a common thread. This is a common pain point. Um, and so the first question I asked was, what offloads are there? Oh, let me get my rat, little rat tail here. Um, what offloads are there and what's supported? Now, if you take the kind of parts Alex was talking about, Intel IXGBE, they basically have all of it. And uh, a lot of them also have LRO as well. But if you look at the virtual mix, there's a lot of red here about things they don't support. And my question over here really was, I'm working on Hyper-V now. Which one of these things would matter at all? Which ones, you know, what sort of priority should I put on them? Would they matter? Um, and I used KVM Vert.io as my test bed for two, a couple of simple reasons. First of all, if I use VMware, violates the license, I can't possibly quote anything. Uh, if I use Hyper-V and it's bad, I probably lose my job right now. <laughs> so I'll just use Vert.io because it's a well-known thing and everybody in this room can go test on it. Um, plus, I plan to fix all these. That's really... Um, so the system I used to test this was a pretty standard server system, nothing really wild, just a modern Intel processor, uh, DDR4 memory and KVM and current generation kernels. Um, if you go run old enterprise kernels, you probably get worse numbers. It's also important to note that you've got to have all your memory banks populated. This memory bandwidth number is four times, one for each memory bank. If you've got a system with only one memory bank, you get one quarter of the memory bandwidth. And that really shows up in this test. And so, first question I asked myself was, what is the theoretical performance that I could maximally get for this thing? What is the bulk throughput? And I guess the PDF slide doesn't build as well. But basically, there's four copies, one from the application into the guest kernel, 
one from the guest kernel into the host. The bridge doesn't really do a copy, it just moves the SKB around and then gets copied back up. So you're copying the packet four times. And my best case scenario here is we're using TCP with TSO and GRO. We can get each one of those would be a 64K packet. So let's assume we're doing really well. If we do that, we have four copies. We have two system calls and two VM exits. Actually, you have four VM exits because as I was writing the paper, I said, well, what about the act coming back? But it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. So you got the packet size versus how fast you can mem copy. So it basically takes you 1.2 microseconds to copy that 64K packet. There's a little other bad side effect. When you're doing these bulk transfers, you're basically killing your CPU cache. You're filling your CPU cache with the data you're transiting through. So everything else gets slowed down in the process. Uh, the VM exits, I uh, found a benchmark and ran it to about half microsecond. And the syscall, I ran a benchmark, comes out about the same. Basically, it's not surprising on an Intel CPU. You have a lot of context you have to save when you go between environments. So if you do that, it comes out to around 147 TSO packets a second, which comes out, if you do the math, to about 77 gigabits a second. It's the maximum rate you can get between VMs. Actually, doing the math a little more carefully, it's a little bit lower. It's about 66 when you count the acts going back. Um, and I was using iProof with just a single stream and got 41 gigabits a second. So about 60% of what I math said I could get. Which, not good, bad, but still not really what you'd like to see. Um, so the next question I said was, well, what happens if I turn on and off some of the offloads and play with things? Well, the first thing is turning on and off TSO had absolutely no effect. Uh, I'll get to the question in a second. Did you turn it on and off on the guest driver on your on your front? On the guest. So you, you were playing with the part, with the front end. Yeah, the you're playing with this iPro sender. Yes. Um, and GLO likewise I was playing with on the receiver. So either side it meant no change. My suspicion is this goes all the way back to the current TCP um, small Q related pacing model sizing that went on that was talked about in the earlier talk that we may not actually be sending full-size TSO frames in this environment anyway, because the kernel may be deciding that the queue isn't big enough or the rate isn't high enough. Um, it, just as an experiment, I turned off transmit checksums and the performance dropped to seven gigabits. So, major hit. Um, kind of as an aside, I said, what if Instead of going from guest to guest via the host, I gave each guest a virtual function device with SIRV and used the internal switch in the hardware. And gets 17 gigabits a second, which two things that's surprising. One, that's a 10 gigabit card, <laughs> which I really expected only to get 10 gigabits out. Second one is, I was wondering where that number came from, and I guess on Alex's talk, it's pretty much the PCI bandwidth that I've got on the box. So I've traded... Jumbo frames enabled, right? What? You got jumbo frames enabled? No. no. But I'm getting TSOs. I had TSO back on, so it's probably effective. So basically, that's interesting because I traded CPU cycles for PCI cycles. What's also not really shown here is all the tests I ran when I did it in software had like a one or two gigabit standard deviation. So I'd have to run a large set of tests and average them. Otherwise, I would see this, the SRLV one, dead on, 17 gigabits every time, no change, any test run. <laughs> so that was particularly interesting. Um, just to go a little more exploring, I said, well, maybe this cache effect might be a 
part of the thing. So I turned on the TX no cache copy option. Performance dropped to 34.4 gigabits a second. So I'm really wondering if we really want to even bother keeping that around. Maybe there is a use case it's good for, and still Tom did it initially, but maybe somebody. Um, and then the last one is I went ahead and turned on the RX Busy Poll. In the guest. And what happens is, since you're both transferring, the RX Busy Poll ties up the CPU so much that the this, ta this CPU is too busy now triggering the kernel goes off that it thinks you've got a, a stuck task and kills it or crashes. So for bulk throughput, RX Busy Poll, at least in software, is a really bad idea. Um, now, since I do buffer bloat stuff sometimes and it's kind of important to me, I said, well, doing a single stream test is one bit of data, but you really want to do multiple streams and you want to look at what the latency of all is. Oh, so first thing I did was just to run, this is a stock default test. There's something called the flexible network test environment. It used to be called R rule that basically runs netperf, runs multiple threads, sending and receiving at the same time and measures ping latency and produces these nice charts. <laughs> um, the top one is the, how fast the guest-to-guest -guest TCP one direction is going, and the other one is the TCP upload. So basically, these two numbers should be the same. They should be flat. They're not. Um, and then this is the ping time, which holds pretty much constant. The colors are basically, it uses different um, type of service options, which if you've got a network where you've got priority going on, you can see the different colors will diverge. In this case, all the streams are just being noisy. Um, one thing I did with this test is I also said, well, what if I try different QDIS on the guest? Would it have any impact? And every test I ran pretty much produced the same picture. So all the normal set of QDIS, FQ, FQCODL, P5 for fast, all those pretty much produce the same value. So it says that's not an interesting data point. So just about the time I did that, BBR came out. I said, well, why don't I run, oh, and I also just said, why don't I try running data center TCP because this kind of looks like a data center environment thing. And this is an example where it was actually worse. Um, it kind of vibrated, it got confused and was ECN bouncing up and down in rates and it kept the same. And I also decided to run BBR. And this one was, this is the data point that still I don't understand. Um, the throughput one direction was basically like double what I was getting before. So it's up to about 55 gigabits. Uh, no, if we go back, this one's s sitting at about 3.5. This one's much faster in one direction, but terrible in the other direction. And I don't understand why this is happening. Um, it could be that my suspicion is that BBR is assuming that it's going on a real network, that what it's doing is not impacting results, and maybe there's some sort of you know, cache effect, Heisenberg thing going on. Um, but I'm puzzled by it. That's why I brought it in. It's like, so, so after doing these tests, I started to ask myself, what could I change to make it better? First thing was, why do we use, have to use just standard TCP? Um, everything here was with the MTO 1500. Now, in a real data center environment, you can have bigger MT, but then you have to go out the door with something else. And I was thinking, you know, internally inside a server, it'd be nice to even just go with full-size 64K frames. Um, but the current concept of MTU is a little rough for that. Uh, we have TCP met route metrics and so on, but you really be nice to figure out a way to manage that better and come up with a better solution. Um, 
so that inner VM traffic would see 64K inside the same data center, nine, you could jumbo frames, and maybe you're going out the door, it'd be 1,500. Um, I question whether the assumptions of a, a just a initial congestion window and the whole CWIN mechanisms really make sense. It does the network model of a software-based two things communicating with each other even fit the control theory models of TCP? Um, is there something else that needs to be added? And lastly, um, every hypervisor environment has invented its own inter-VM communication socket family. And the next step I want to do is test VMware's, KDM's, and Hyper-V's version of that and see what the performance of this is. Personally, as a long-time network person, I really don't like to see custom socket families vetted because it means an application change, it means infrastructure change, it doesn't necessarily help anything. Um, and to what you end up doing is building another abstraction on top of it, like CMQ or something to, to, to deal with the model. But um, right now, you don't have any good data on that. Um, Michael and the guys who do Vert.io have done a new version called Vert.io 1.1. It's not on by default, but you can go look at the KVM form. And what it address, tries to address is right now the Vert.io, the way the rings are laid out in software causes a lot of cache misses and doesn't get any batching. Related to this is the fact that the Vert.io driver in the way it manages transmit frames does not implement byte queue limits. Because it doesn't implement byte queue limits, it doesn't really get TCP small queues. No, it's more than that. It, it, uh, it's so right. No back There's no back pressure. So without back pressure, you, you cannot... In, right. Uh, so uh, I think that the Vert.io driver really needs to change to make this environment more stable and at, it may not gain the performance, but it will probably be more stable. And the other question I have is um, kind of like uh, when they were mentioning before lockless Q disks, do we need bulk receive and bulk transmit? Um, in a virtual environment, it'd be nice to wake up the guest and say, here's 64 packets, go process them, um, because the cost of that wake up is always there. Um, well, then maybe you will trigger the same bug than the busy poll stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's true, but... Um, well, but then if we have KSOFT IRQD working again, maybe. it won't, won't be as much of a problem. Um, the other one is, back to the four copies, do we really need to have the kernel user copy? Um, the first one that's kind of been mentioned earlier in this talk this today is that there's a splice MMAP hack where you can basically say MMAP, a memory region, splice, send that FD to send. Kind of trades off uh, copy for threading because that splice has to wait until that send has been act. So then you end up with having to write a ping pong kind of application that has one in flight send and another in pending. It gets kind of messy. Um, Linux does, has, barely has AIO support, and it was never really implemented for networking. Um, I don't know, I think it's just so painful that we'll never get there. But other operating systems, that's how they solve that problem, to reduce it. Um, another way people have attacked this problem is to do the networking in user space. Um, 90% of this room is familiar with the DBK, which has totally separate drivers, and the thread model basically pushes all the heavy lifting to the application. There's a new FIDO project called TLDK, which is TCP in user space. I looked at it. They aren't really off the ground yet, so they weren't really testable. But if you were building an application and that was your pain point, you could go that direction. And lastly, it's worth mentioning there are people that just don't run kernels at all in the guest. They run unit kernels, where basically everything's in kernel mode. Uh, Claudius, the Rump Kernel Project, a bunch of other things are all work that way. Um, 
Hey, Steve, did you, did you, I'm over here. Did you look at any ideas for, I mean, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get data into the application space. Right. Right? Well, if the data was coming from an application and it was in memory, right? Why, why does the network stack even need to be there at all? Because right? it's a different guess and different security domain and the person in the middle wants to interpose some security thing. I mean, that's the, the other one people always ask is why not use shared memory? But in these environments, everybody always wants to impose some set of security policy about who's allowed to talk to whom about what. So if you had a security policy that you could manage shared memory right. with, it would probably be a... That would be a good way to do it, especially if you could manage... Uh, that, yeah, the other thing is I'm not working for a chip vendor, but chip vendors always talk about chip extensions to allow memory to be controlled and accessed and passed around. I would also postulate uh, to your earlier question about the, the SRIOV device having a good solid number all the time was probably because it had BQL implemented. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was responding to the back pressure very right. efficiently. Thanks to Eric over there. Um, and lastly, the copy at the vSwitch level, you know, I mentioned yeah, shared memory, the issue there is security. And also, uh, in, in next generation environment, people are talking about encrypted memory in VMs. So if you have two different VMs with two different encryption keys, you have to figure out, a, you've got at least to have one copy to somehow take what was encrypted memory in one guest to put it in the other domain. Um, and like I said, the SRV vSwitch in hardware is another possibility for this or some hardware support. Um, with that, I tried to cut the talk down. So thank you. Do I have time for questions? Uh, well, I go around to the J because he's in the middle, and then we can work back. So on the, the, the TSO with Vertio, doesn't Vertio, if you have TSO enabled, simply send the whole unit up as a single blob without splitting it apart? Well, it's actually, I think what it does is it sends it into vHost as one big blob. But at some point, it has to go spin it back up as individual MTU size things into the vert IO the other way where it gets GRO reassembled. So. Wouldn't it be nice if it just didn't have to chop that right. at all? That's kind of related to the MTU thing. If we could figure out how we vert IO could say, or whatever virtual environment could say, I can take this size frame if you really want to give it to me and I'll chop it, you know. Oh, um, just as an aside, uh, Hyper-V has a, another copy involved because it basically has one giant receipt buffer that holds multiple frames, so we have to extract right now the frames out of that buffer. So, but. Yes, Steve, did, did, you, um, did you check on the VRTAL extensions to allow VM to VM communications? I mean, I, I think that's... I was, I, I was just using what's in the standard upstream kernel with vhost net and all the normal things that are enabled in every other. And still related, I mean, you know, with QNU, with IVS instruments, with VMware, with VMCI, you can have I didn't them. get into the IV shared memory and all that. And, and what about the model uh, made from infinite one made of RDMAs, having some sh uh, register memories? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's another possibility. But then the question is, can you do RDMA and software and how much software support there is for it? So about the non-temporal copies, um, someone else on the list had mentioned that they were seeing a performance regression also using it. So I think the, the intent is to take it out. Um, but I, I have to admit, it's kind of disappointing. Maybe the Intel guys can explain this. But it should, should um, theoretically improve things. If you're not using the data, we're saving the cache. Yeah, I, so I know. I think maybe. It's maybe just there's a trade-off. Maybe my guess is maybe there needs to be some trade-off where we do a cache version to the first bulk of the first shot of the data where the header is likely to be, and then do the non-cache version to the bulk afterwards, um, because you know the host or something on the net other side is going to look at that data right away. Well. So in this case, that's true, but even in the normal case where we're just copying 
user data into the kernel with the expectation that's just going to be sent as is once we add the yeah. TCP header. We don't expect any of that data to be, to be accessed in the kernel. No. So the expectation was that non-temporal copies should, should right. have saved us and it didn't. But one other question, so if you go back to the slide where we're trying to save the kernel user copy. Yep. Uh, you mentioned there were two copies. Can we eliminate the, I guess, the user to user copy also? There's a kernel to user and there's a uh, kernel to there's uh, kernel to host. So the the host right now extracts the memory in V host extracts the memory from one guest, puts it in its kernel copy, and then eventually puts it back in the other kernel other guest kernel. Um, but this was on one on like the transmitter side. I think you had two copies in line, right? Uh, if you go back, I think it was the earlier slide. Yeah, this, that one. So basically, this copy is because vhostnet extracts the data buffers from vertio. Probably because vertio's queue is so small, um, it can't really. It wants to be able to give the data back. But we're copying the data twice, right? Yeah. So, I mean, theoretically, we could do something, you know, I mean, Zen does things with page flipping, but then page flipping runs into the, the, the TLB issues with multiple CPUs, so. Over here, there's a question. Here, um, okay, somebody's got the mic, there. Can, yeah. can you go back to the slide where you did multiple experiments, disable GRO and able to so. Okay. Uh, that yes, one. this one. So, uh, Regarding the TSO segmentation offload disabling, initially you said that uh, VM exits cost a lot, and now theoretically should be much more VM exits, unless the kernel does GSO. The transmit moral kick in. Yeah. The same number of VM exits. Yeah, actually, it, it turns out that if, if, if you have TSO off, the software will generate a bunch of frames which have transmit more set, which causes the same number of VM exits. Okay, so the virtual driver implements transmit more. Okay, good. No, actually, yeah, it implements transmit more, but it, because it doesn't do byte queue limits, it doesn't get that for the normal case. So it only gets that for one G, one TSO frame. It doesn't get that for the back-to-back -back frames. Okay, and regarding the, the yellow uh, boosting that you got, and maybe Tom addressed this, can you explain it a bit more? What, what's your hypothesis regarding this one? Uh, there's an option that was added to basically, in the socket layer, don't copy the data with a normal mem copy, but use the CPU instructions that do not cause the data not to pollute the cache. And the idea here is that the user data can just go to memory. We don't need to hit the CPU cache with it because in the normal case, we're, we're, we're gonna put this in memory and then we're gonna hand it to a hardware device and the hardware device is gonna send it, is the idea. But in reality, in this case, it doesn't help. I don't know if I didn't test the north-south case, it may help. No, Here it helped, what do you mean it didn't help? You jumped from, you, you came to 34 gigabit. Right, from 40, um, from 40 something on the Oh, board. so it, yeah. oh, you, you started from 40? It went from 41 down to, oh. s s to uh, 34. If I remember right, I think that option used to be enabled by default and I actually submitted a patch. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Tom, I think it was Tom did and you turned it off. Where do you work now? <laughs> um, so for your TCP congestion control test, what's the difference in the upstream uh, setup? Like the downstream upstream? Basically, this is all a script wrapper around NetPerf, and it basically starts a bunch of NetPerfs in parallel, or with multiple threads in both directions, and then does pings and measures the results. So the upload should be just the just the they should both be they should both be the same matching lines maybe one in the ideal case they should both be the same both directions. I see. So do you, do you, could you share the traces at least for BBR because I'm really curious about the the regression you're saying. Yeah, uh, I was going to give you offline. I know, uh, but whichever way is the least intrusive way and the most useful to you, I can get that data. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> but it should be a really easy test for you to set up. It's not a hard 
It's not like I'm asking you to find a 100 gigabit network card. And <laughs> so um, about the comment about 1500 MTU, David Stevens has done that for Sunwinet for Spark. And we got some really good numbers from that. So that might, there might be some things in there that are generalizable. So you might want to look there. Um, also, you mentioned um, uh, special sockets families. And you said it's, they're in for inter-VM. Aren't they for uh, VM to hypervisor communication? No, a lot of these are for inter-VM communication as well. But how does the network stack use it? You'd have to open, make a different version of NetPerf that yes. cause, calls those, those address families. Basically, you give a guest ID instead of a, a, a socket. Yes. And you, instead of an IP address, then you just get a byte stream. You, uh, you mentioned that you had not yet fiddled with MTU. Um, but I was wondering, I mean, one possibility could be, although you trade off some operational complexity, giving the virtual, uh, giving the VM two interfaces, one with the bog standard MTU toward the internet and one, or toward anything off the box, and one with 65K, uh, you'd have to manage which routes are re reachable east yeah, west, but, but, but. I was going to do it with one and just have the routes and, and add attributes on the routes. Um, yeah. Um, but, you know, tests get involved in stages, so you start out with the simple and go to the yeah, more yeah, complex. Yeah, of course, of course. So, just a quick comment about the performance issues. I mean, what we have seen sometimes, if you run with near cores or far cores on Intel's systems, you get different performance. Because even if you're on a single socket, inside the socket, all the cores are not equal, and it's like a micro memory system. Yeah, and that, that is another issue. It could probably relate to pinning and stuff like that. I didn't. I didn't play around with pinning of guests. And Who's up next? Uh, stacked VLANs. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.